Perfect. Hey, Matt, how you doing, man? Good. How about you? I'm doing well. Listen, uh, I, I'm in a good state. I'm sure you certainly are as well. Would be better if you had $750,000 attached. <laughs> but yeah, well, I guess to start, I got to ask with how things ended. How surprised were you by the way the jury votes shook out? Did you think you had this in the bag? Uh, you know, I don't ever assume things 100%. Uh, I thought maybe it would have been a little closer. I was thinking maybe I would get a fourth read or it's going to be three, four. Um, there was a lot of things to consider. You know, with jury, it's hard to tell. You know, it's not America voting. It's not random people voting. It's the jury. And sometimes you have a jury that votes for social game. And sometimes you have a jury that votes for comp beast, you know. And I think that's what kind of happened here maybe. I think I believe that I had a better social game with the jury and everyone in the house, but Jag ultimately had a better competitive strategic game. Yeah, so at the jury round table, at least, we saw some of the jurors were saying, you know, Matt had some really great plays and was able to betray us with that lovely smile. We need him to own his game. And I think there were some points during that Q&A where maybe in retrospect, you know, that wasn't necessarily the case. Talk to me about how you handled that Q&A. Uh, were you surprised at all yeah. by the questions? I mean, I'm not good at Q&As, you know, on the spot. Uh, you know, I like the time to think about what I'm going to say before I say it. And, uh, you know, it's, there's a lot of pressure. It's live and it's on the spot. Um, you know, I think like something that Corey had asked, if I can remember, it was him asking about what was my best lie in the game or something. You know, mm -hmm. I think I just kind of assumed people knew. Like, I'm like, my biggest lie was probably me being half power. No one knew. Um because I try to play this game as truthful as I could be, you know, not getting blood on my hands and trying to play everyone's, you know, good side, you know. And I knew not to lie, obviously, but, you know, at the end of the day, the truth was I was going to choose Shag to get farther with me. And um, it's hard uh, because for my game, you know, of course, I try to make everyone, like I said, I wanted – I told you what you wanted to hear. That was my biggest thing is I was telling people what they wanted to hear, making them feel good. I'm never going to win an HOA, so I'm never going to be breaking promises, you know, putting someone up the block. So I could easily just be like, I'll never put you up. Don't worry. Um, you know, that was my biggest angles and stuff. Um, yeah. Mm, so, I mean, you talk about path to power. In your speeches tonight, you had said, I won it. I saved Jag. I was fine if he left. He obviously wasn't. I'm really intrigued now looking back on that decision. What made you decide to play that power in that moment? And how do you look back on it considering that, yes, you did go to the end with Chag, but you ultimately lost to him? Right. It's, that's like worst case scenario to happen. You know, it's, I always had that in my head. Like, what if it's me and Jag and Jag wins in the end? You know, that's like the almost the perfect storyline where someone used to power save someone they win in the end um you know ultimately i think i'm still glad i used it i need it that showed good things you know people thought it was a scary thing but for me it showed that i was a loyal person i was willing to protect people i'm working with and that's how i tried to portray myself in this game is i was a loyal hard worker and a team player and that power showed that because i didn't use it selfishly and i think when people started finding out i played in that people liked it because they were like, so me using that power, you know, I could take it back. Uh, but it was also my strategic gameplay. I was trying to show everyone I was a team player, a loyal player. And because people started finding out that I did this, it was kind of good because people were like, oh, I want to work with him. He's loyal and he's a team player. So that helped my game, you know, ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, had I not done that, Jag be gone. I don't know who I would have worked closely with and trust 100%, you know. And no one would have known, like, everyone would have just kept thinking of me as a physical threat and the only physical threat in the house because Jag would have been gone. So I kind of needed Jag to be in this game. You know, I kind of – he was my shield. You know, I knew if it was ever me and Jag up the block, Jag would be the one going home. So as long as Jag's in this house, I'm in this house. And that was my biggest strategy there. Yeah, so obviously Jag was a, a big name that you were talking about throughout the season. Another couple of big names. I got to say, you were doing a lot of Cormerica talk, Matt, even more than some of the stands out there the past couple of weeks. And, you know, you said uh, some really interesting things. You know, you had 
uh, not understood how they were sort of getting together. You had said that America seemed almost like a, a cheater type. You had felt that, you know, you didn't think she was that smart because she couldn't cook or clean. And the audience has perceived a lot of these comments as misogynistic. Okay. I, I would love to hear just your own perspective from your own words about your thoughts yeah. on that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I had a feeling that could come up. You know, I'm very roasty. I joke hard with my friends, and I always roast my friends out of love. Like, my friends make fun of me so much for my deafness as a joke. So I kind of do the same, you know. Uh, I obviously don't hate America and Corey. Um, you know, I think they're both great people at the end of the day. Um, with America, I <laughs> think what started out was because I was cooking slop wig, and I was pissed off. I was doing all the cooking with red. Um, so that was the joke with the whole cooking thing. And then, mm. um, yeah, I mean, they were, I'm, I joke hard. Like it's never to be bad intent or malicious. It's always out of love. Um, uh, and the day and like, I know if they feel that way, I'll have a great talk with them about it, you know, because I, they know who I am and the day and I know who they are at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. They know. They call me Maddie Smokes, Maddie, Maddie Rose. Like, it's a joke. Like, I always roast people like that. Mm. Last thing I want to ask is, obviously, you make so much Big Brother history with being the first deaf contestant on the show, and hopefully not the last. You know, I think you opened a lot of doors for people across various disabilities to be on the show. What advice do you have for people coming onto the show from the disability community in the future? Yeah, I think that was my biggest goal was displaying that, uh, being the first person here to do that. Hopefully, and I believe I did, lay the foundation for the next deaf person or someone with a disability to come on here and try out because look how far I've come. The first person to do it and I made it the entire day, the entire day, the entire time. I went 100 days, you know, no other deaf players have ever played this game and I got that far. I'm proud of myself and that just shows that the worst enemy is yourself. You're the one stopping yourself. You tell yourself you can do something, then you go do it because you can do it and you can prove to everyone that you can do it.